Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, Ashley and I will bring you stories along with Dan Friedel and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present the next part in our series on America's presidents. But first, Sri Lanka's Prime Minister warned last month that the island nation's economy had collapsed. In recent days, the government itself collapsed. As tens of thousands of protesters occupied the homes of its leaders. Angry over the country's economic problems, protesters took over President Gotabaya Rajapaksa's and Prime Minister Ranil Wickremasinghe's official homes. They demanded that the two leaders step down. The incident came after months of shortages of fuel, food, medicine, and other necessities. President Rajapaksa has not been seen or heard from publicly since Saturday. His office said Sunday that he ordered the immediate release of cooking gas to the public. But the Speaker of the Parliament said Rajapaksa would step down on Wednesday. Prime Minister Wickremasinghe said Monday that he would stay on until a new government is in place because he wants to work within the Constitution. The Prime Minister also noted that the crowd burned down his house and destroyed what he called a treasure of 2,500 books. Mahinda Yapa Abewardena is the Speaker of the South Asian Nations Parliament. He said Monday that the lawmakers will meet on Friday to elect a new president. In a statement, he added, The ruling party has said the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are ready to resign to appoint an all party government. Opposition leaders have also discussed forming a different unity government. Sajit Premadasa is the leader of the main opposition party, which holds 54 seats in the 225 member parliament. He said it was ready to step into the government. We, as the opposition, are ready to provide leadership to stabilize the country. And rebuild the economy, he said. We will appoint a new president, prime minister, and form a government. Dulles Ala Pirma, who was a minister under Rajapaksa, has also been involved in talks to form a new government. But the two opposition leaders have not agreed on a power sharing deal. If the opposition fails to form a government by the time Rajapaksa resigns, Wickremasinghe, as Prime Minister, will become acting president under Sri Lanka's constitution. However, in line with the protesters' demand, opposition leaders do not want him to take over even as acting president. They called on Wickremasinghe to resign and permit the parliament speaker. To be acting president. The position is the next in line based on the Constitution. Economists say the crisis comes from years of poor leadership and corruption. They also say it comes from other troubles, such as growing debt, the effects of the pandemic, and terror attacks that hurt the tourism industry. Sri Lankans have mainly blamed Rajapaksa for the collapse of the nation's economy. Rajapaksa appointed Wickremasinghe as Prime Minister in May in an effort to solve the shortages and start economic recovery. But delays in providing basic supplies 
have turned public anger against him, with protesters accusing him of protecting the president. The World Food Program said that nearly 9 out of 10 families in Sri Lanka are going without some meals or otherwise decreasing how much they eat. The government has been seeking help from the International Monetary Fund and neighboring India and China to pay for food and fuel. And the country has $51 billion in foreign debts that it cannot repay. The protests appear to bring an end to the nearly 20 years of rule by the Rajapaksa family. D. A. Rajapaksa was a lawmaker in the 1950s and 60s. His son, Mahinda Rajapaksa, served as Prime Minister and President from 2004 to 2015. Gotabaya Rajapaksa, a younger brother, became President in 2019. He brought Mahinda back as Prime Minister and appointed other family members to important government positions. Mahinda resigned in May after weeks of anti-government protests that turned violent. And Gotabaya is now on his way out. When the setting sun lines up just right with the buildings in New York City, it is called Manhattan Henge. The name combines the words Manhattan, New York City's central area, and Stonehenge, an ancient group of stones in Britain. The sun sets in line with the tall buildings in the city four times each year. The final time for 2022 is going to be Tuesday, July 12th. At about 8 p.m. local time, people will be able to see the sun going down along the Hudson River on the city's west side. For the fourth time this year, however, it will be a special view that is because the buildings along the wide streets that go east and west perfectly frame the sun. Wide streets with especially good views are 14th Street, 23rd Street, 34th Street, 42nd Street, and 57th Street. The effect is more dramatic, observers say, further east in the city. You can even see it from some parts of the borough of Queens. The term Manhattan Henge comes from famous astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. An astrophysicist studies the physics and chemistry of stars. deGrasse Tyson came up with the name in a 1997 magazine piece. He said he thought of it because he went to see Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England, when he was a boy. DeGrasse Tyson was part of a group of scientists who came up with the idea that Stonehenge was an ancient astronomical observatory. In England, the rays of the sun hit the stone circle at the summer solstice. The solstice is the day when the sun reaches its northernmost point in the sky, and also marks the start of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. The ancient people who built Stonehenge between 5,000 and 3,500 years ago probably planned for their structure to line up with the setting sun, but those who built the tall buildings and laid out New York City did not plan for the special sunsets. It just worked out that way. I'm Dan Friedel. A new mutation of the coronavirus is raising concerns after appearing in India and other nations. Scientists say the mutation is genetically linked to Omicron, an earlier version or variant of the coronavirus. The new mutation, called BA275, is being called a sub-variant of Omicron. Omicron and another coronavirus version, Delta, 
have spread widely across the world during the COVID-19 pandemic. Researchers say they are studying the new subvariant to find out whether it might cause more serious disease than past Omicron versions. It's still really early on for us to draw too many conclusions, said infectious disease expert Matthew Binnaker. He is director of clinical virology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Binnaker told the Associated Press that, especially in India, the rates of infection with BA.275 appear to be showing an exponential increase. The latest mutation has been found in several distant states in India. It appears to be spreading faster than other versions in those areas, said Lippi Thukral. She is a scientist at the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in New Delhi. The sub-variant has also appeared in about ten other countries, including the United States, Australia, Germany, Britain, and Canada. Shishi Lo is the head of infectious diseases for Helix, a company that supplies viral sequencing information to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She told the AP the fact that the latest mutation has already been discovered in many parts of the world, even with lower levels of viral surveillance, is an early sign that it is spreading. Health experts are concerned about a large number of mutations that separate the new subvariant from older Omicron versions. Some of those mutations are in areas that could permit the virus to attach to cells more effectively, Binnaker said. Another concern is that genetic differences may make it easier for the virus to get past antibodies produced in the body as a reaction to a vaccine or an infection from earlier versions. But health officials still believe vaccines and booster shots are the best defense against severe COVID-19. Later this year, it is likely the U.S. will get new vaccine formulations to target more recent Omicron versions. Disease experts say it may take several weeks to get a sense for how the latest Omicron subvariant may affect the direction of the pandemic. Dr. Gagandeep Kong studies viruses at India's Christian Medical College in Valore. She told the AP the latest mutation demonstrates the need for continued efforts to closely follow viruses that combine genetic efforts with real-world information about who is getting sick and how badly. It is important that surveillance isn't a start-stop strategy, Kong said. I'm Brian Lin. A small study from the U.S. National Institutes of Health says the immune response caused by COVID-19 infection may damage the brain's blood vessels. The reaction could lead to neurological problems known as long COVID. In the study, researchers examined brain changes in nine people who died suddenly after being infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. The results appeared last week in the publication Brain. 
The researchers found that antibodies, proteins produced by the immune system to fight viruses, are involved in an attack on the cells lining the brain's blood vessels. This causes inflammation and damage. The results were similar to an earlier study done in 2020. In both studies, SARS-CoV-2 was not found in the patient's brains. This suggests the virus was not attacking the brain directly. NIH scientist Avindra Nath is the senior researcher of the study. He said, We had previously shown blood vessel damage and inflammation in patients' brains at autopsy, but we didn't understand the cause of the damage. An autopsy is the examination of a dead body to find out the cause of death. For the study, Dr. Nath and a team of researchers examined brain tissue from nine individuals between the ages of 24 and 73. The individuals were chosen because their scans showed signs of blood vessel damage in the brain. The scans were then compared to those from 10 individuals in a control group. The researchers found that antibodies produced to fight COVID-19 may mistakenly target cells that line the brain's blood vessels. These cells, called endothelial cells, serve as barriers to keep harmful substances from reaching the brain. Damage to the cells causes bleeding and blockage in some COVID-19 patients and increases the risk of stroke. As in the earlier study, researchers found signs of leaky blood vessels. This suggests that the links between endothelial cells in the blood-brain barrier were damaged. Dr. Nath said that once the leaks happened, immune cells may come to repair the damage, setting up inflammation in the brain. Researchers also found changes in gene expression in areas with damage to the endothelial cells. More than 300 genes showed decreased expression, while six genes showed increased expression. The affected genes are connected to the brain's ability to deal with chemical imbalances in the body. Together, these findings may provide information about the cause of neurological problems related to COVID-19. The findings may also be used to find new treatments to target the damaged links between the endothelial cells in the blood-brain barrier. The study may also help with understanding and treating long-term neurological conditions after COVID-19. The conditions include headache, tiredness, loss of taste and smell, sleep problems, and forgetfulness known as brain fog. If the nine patients in the study had survived, the researchers believe they would have likely developed long COVID. It is quite possible that this same immune response persists in long COVID patients, Dr. Nath said. The findings, he added, are very important to researchers seeking to find treatments for long COVID. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. James Monroe easily won election in 1816. He had a relaxed, likable personality and was popular with voters. In addition, Many saw him as a last connection to the country's founding generation. Monroe had fought in George Washington's army during the Revolutionary War against British rule. He was a diplomat during Thomas Jefferson's presidency and helped complete the Louisiana Purchase. Monroe served as James Madison's Secretary of State and briefly as his Secretary of War as well, during the War of 1812. Voters' positive feelings carried Monroe into office and defined his presidency. When Monroe became president, the United States had just declared victory against British forces in the War of 1812. 
The American economy was also doing well, at least at first. And the government was mostly united under a single party. But Monroe did have one immediate problem. He and his wife, Elizabeth, could not move into the president's house right away. The British had burned it badly in an attack on Washington, D.C. Workers were busy making repairs. So Monroe decided to go on a trip. He spent the first weeks of his presidency traveling. He went north into New England, visiting important places from the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812. Everywhere he went, he reminded Americans of their shared, proud history. He even wore clothes in the old colonial style. One of Monroe's nicknames is the last of the cocked hats. Then President Monroe turned west, toward lands that white migrants were increasingly settling. They were able to move west in part because American soldiers had defeated a powerful alliance of Native American tribes. What had been a victory for the U.S. government was a crushing loss for Native Americans. Many tribes moved farther west, Others began to lose their languages and their customs as white settlers took control. For Monroe, however, the visit west was a positive sign of the country's expansion. By the time he returned to Washington, Monroe had met many Americans. He had learned for himself the geography of the country, and he had demonstrated that all parts of the U.S. could be connected by patriotism and a common federal government. One newspaper called Monroe's presidency the beginning of an era of good feelings. Four years later, Monroe won a second term even more easily than his first. Yet James Monroe's presidency had several crises. One was the country's first economic depression in more than 30 years. Another was over slavery. The country had been divided over the issue since its founding. By the end of 1819, 11 states, all in the South, permitted slavery. 11 states, all in the North, did not. The question became, would the new states in the West permit it? Monroe had to face the question, when settlers asked Congress permission for Missouri Territory to become a state. Many enslaved people already lived there. White settlers expected to bring more. But a member of Congress from a northern state proposed that Missouri could become a state only if it banned slavery. That proposal started a debate that lasted more than a year. For the most part, the debate was not based on the moral problems with people owning other people. Instead, it involved economic and political concerns. Northerners argued that slaveholding states had an unfair economic advantage. In addition, if Missouri entered the Union as a slave state, its lawmakers would move the balance of power toward the South. The debate continued so long that another area asked to enter the Union. People in northern Massachusetts wanted to organize into an independent state called Maine. After some time, lawmakers offered a compromise. They said Maine could be admitted as a free state and Missouri as a slave state. But they also made a line across a map of the country. They said Congress would not admit another slave state north of that line. James Monroe signed into law what became known as the Missouri Compromise. It settled the issue of slavery, at least officially, in the U.S. for more than 20 years. But everyone knew that the peace between pro-slavery and anti-slavery groups was only temporary. In 1823, 
Monroe made one of the most important foreign policy decisions in American history. It became known as the Monroe Doctrine. It related to Spain's colonies in Latin America. Monroe had dealt with Spain before. In his first term, he and his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, successfully negotiated with Spain to buy Florida for the United States. By Monroe's second term, Spain had also lost control of some of its former colonies in Latin America. The president became concerned that Spain's European allies would try to help the country regain power. He did not want European powers interfering in areas so close to U.S. territory and so important to U.S. trade. So Monroe gave a speech to Congress. He said, the U.S. would stay out of Europe's affairs. But, he said, Europe should also stay out of Latin America's affairs. And Monroe declared that European powers would not be permitted to begin colonizing any area in the Western Hemisphere. In other words, Monroe declared that the U.S. considered the entire Western Hemisphere its sphere of influence. Historians note that Monroe did not aim for the declaration to be a major statement, but it became a base of American foreign policy and supported U.S. expansion throughout the 19th century. James Monroe was the fourth and last president in the Virginia dynasty. Except for John Adams, four of the first five American presidents were from Virginia. Monroe and his wife returned to their home there after he left office. They had a close relationship with each other, as well as with their two surviving children, both daughters. Unlike many politicians of his time, Monroe had brought his family with him on his travels. He also believed strongly in education for girls. When the Monroes lived in France, young Eliza Monroe attended the best school for girls in Paris. This loving family spent as much time together as possible. So, when Elizabeth Monroe died, James Monroe was filled with sorrow. His health also began to fail. He moved to the house of his younger daughter, Maria, in New York City. James Monroe died there one year later at age 73. Like two other former presidents, Monroe died on the 4th of July, America's birthday. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 